a very good evening to you and praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us once again for another episode of the Bible study. My name is Pastor T. Mwangi and today we'll be looking at Ezekiel chapter number 24. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our Lord, we bless you and we honor you. And we pray that indeed the light of revelation will illuminate on the pages of scripture. And dear Lord, we'll be able to dissect, consume, and see all that the Spirit intended to deliver even to this generation and how it correlates with our lives. Thank you for this night. And it is in Jesus' name we have prayed and believed. So thank you very much. Uh, we are on Ezekiel chapter number 24. And this is always considered as a verse that basically is the last chapter when it comes to the judgments that are being pronounced upon Israel. Beginning from 25 all the way to 32, we will look on the judgments being pronounced upon the nations. And the mystery of this prophecy, on the day it was delivered, on that day, the Jerusalem siege began. Now, for us to fully appreciate, even before I read Ezekiel 24, we have to understand that there were three deportations or exiles journey that happened, not deportations. Yeah, there were three exile journeys that happened upon the children of Israel from their residential place, Jerusalem, to Babylon. And now when Ezekiel landed in Babylon, he began to prophesy from Babylon and he was prophesying about what will happen to the remnants that were left in Jerusalem. So in, when we began, we realized that the Bible says he sat where they sat. He was among the exiles that were in Babylon. There were, there were three exile journeys, and I think Ezekiel went with the second one. Daniel was in the first journey. But the judgment that was coming for the remnants and the exile that will be there was going to be the most severe. But it looked like the people being given the prophecies, all that we have read, the judgments, did not believe that anything will happen to them. And the emphasis kept on building up. And this time we begin to deal with a scripture where we are not talking about what will happen. But on the day he began prophesying in Babylon, that day when this prophecy was written, it is considered to be around 15th or 5th January in 587 BC. On that day when that prophecy was released or conveyed, that day the king of Jerusalem had begun to besiege, I mean the king of Babylon had begun to besiege Jerusalem. The language of besieging is the ancient technology of battle where warriors will come and surround a city and make sure that nobody gets out and nobody gets in. And then after the city is besieged, they either attack the walls and they enter and attack them that are in the city. But the first level of besieging a city was to reduce supply and to introduce starvation until the people surrender out of their own volition to them that have besieged the city. And so this was an ancient technique and tactics of war. So I'm going to read it in different portions because uh, from chapter number one all the way to 14, it's more of a prophetic image and symbolism. The Bible says again, in the ninth year, in the 10th month, on the 10th day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, write down the name of the day this very day. The king of Babylon, sorry, started his siege against Jerusalem this very day and utter a parable to the rebellious house and said to them, thus says the Lord. So looking at that portion of scripture, the very day that this prophecy was pronounced to the people in Babylon, on that day, the king of Babylon launched a siege 
upon the people in Jerusalem. On that day, of course, we see here that uh, right down on the on the day, uh, the day uh, uh, it's in the in the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month. The the Jews were not using the Gregorian calendar, so this is not October. This uh, is according to the Jewish calendar, which is lunar. Lunar means they use the motions of the moon to calculate their days and their years. And days are 360 because they have 30 days. It is the Gregorian calendar that has a leap year because they use the motions of the sun. But sometimes people compare the two calendars and they get the timing according to our calendar, which is what we use is the Gregorian. And so... When the day that parable was uttered on that very day is when the attack began. Now let's begin to appreciate the details of the parable. Put on a pot, set it on, and also pour water into it. Gather pieces of meat in it, every good piece. The thigh, the thigh and the shoulder, fill it with choice cuts. Take the choice of the flock also, Pile fuel bones under it, make it boil well, and let the cut simmer in it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is in it, and whose scum is not gone from it. Bring it out piece by piece, on which no lot has fallen. For her blood is in her midst, she set it on the top of a rock. She did not pour it on the ground to cover it with dust, that it may raise up fury and take vengeance. I have set her blood on top of a rock, that it may not be covered. There, there, therefore, thus says the Lord. So let's begin with a four and five. Uh, the pot there represented Jerusalem. The, the cutting into pieces represented the different portions, the disintegration of the community. And the putting into the pot represented the judgment of fire that was going to come. We have to understand this uh, imagery and symbolism in faces. So the cutting into pieces was the scattering that was going to happen. It will no longer be the community as one. They will be broken into pieces and they will be put in that boiling pot. The judgment that came upon Jerusalem was a judgment of fire. Nebuchadnezzar literally put the city on fire. Even the temple was put on fire. So the Lord is already using, remember I said the Lord was using what they know to explain what they don't know. And God will use what is available to them. The pots that they used to use on that day, they were brazen pots. And brass is the color of of judgment and brass does not trust so this was already very pure and then we continue and begin to see it is no longer called the city of God it is called the bloody city um, and, and it, it is also not only considered as a bloody city it is also considered as a city covered with rust it is not as pure as it ought to be and the bloodshed of that city was not in secret. The idolatry, the shedding of blood for their sacrifices was not in secret. That's why the Bible says she set it on top of a rock for her blood is in her midst. She set it on top of a rock. She did not pour it on the ground to cover it with dust. The blood was open. Their rituals were not hidden. Their sacrifices to the deities that were strange were not hidden. Their idolatry was open. And that's why the Lord is saying all these things happened in public and they never hid this blood. And he gives a very perfect example. I have set her blood on top of a rock that it may not be uh, covered. So, so the Lord is looking at this city and is about to judge it with fire. And because their sins are not hidden, they're just open. And so judgment must come. From verse 10, the Bible says, Woe to the bloody city, I too will make the fire great. Heap on the wood, kindle the fire, cook the meat well, mix in the spices, and let the cats be burned up. 
Then set the pot empty on the coals, that it may become hot and its bronze may burn. Now, the first part of this prophecy is, I will allow the people to suffer in judgment. Let the cats be put in bands. And I tell you, there was a great slaughter. Many people suffered. So the first phase of this prophecy had everything to do with the people. Jerusalem is going to be besieged. Jerusalem will be burned down. The people will suffer the consequences. Remember the port, the bronze port represented Jerusalem. But in verse 11, the Bible says, Then said the port empty on the coals, that it may become hot and its bronze may burn, that its filthiness may be melted in it, that its scum may be consumed. That is the rust. Now, of course, we know bronze does not rust, but that could be the rust because of the blood that was upon it, the defilement. She has grown weary with lies, and her great scum has not gone from her. Let her scum be in your fire. In your filthiness is lewdness, because I have cleansed you, and you are not cleansed. You will not be cleansed of your filthiness anymore, till I have caused my fury to rest upon you. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass, and I will do it. I will not hold back, nor will I spare, nor will I relent. According to your ways and according to your deeds, they will judge you, says the Lord. So, Ezekiel is told to take the boat and subject it to fire until it becomes red hot. So that any rust and anything that clings on the pot melts. Fire becomes the best entity of purifying even metals. And at this particular time, uh, the Lord is giving a very deep communication. Now, one of the reasons why Israel was also judged, it is idolatry, shedding of innocent blood. There was the backsliding of the priesthood and many other things. But for 490 years, Israel had forfeited the land and they never subjected the land into what they called the Sabbath of the land for 490 years. What does that mean? In every seven years, they were supposed to farm for six years and allow the land to rest for one year. And so every seventh year, they were not supposed to farm everything. And the Lord used to give them harvest on the sixth year that was enough to carry them through the sixth the seventh and the eighth year before the harvest, the harvest of the eighth year. The Lord took care of that. It was called the Sabbath of the land. And for those who've done agriculture, that kind of breathing allows the land to rejuvenate and also to, um, you know, to, to renew itself and release new nutrients that can carry on. And so they had abandoned the Sabbath of the land. That is why when Jeremiah prophesied about the captivity of Jerusalem, he said they will be in captivity for 70 years because they had denied the land the 70 years Sabbath. And so not only were the people taken out of the land, but the land was also going through healing. This is a mystery because when you begin to understand the mystery of the land, the dealings that a land can vomit a man, a land can accept a man. A land can also, uh, you know, be defiled. And when defilement happens on the land, <coughs> sorry, it can also begin to affect even productivity and all those things. So ideally, because of defiling the land and not giving the land its Sabbath, the Lord made sure they stayed in Babylon for 70 years so that the land could face its Sabbath. That's why the 70-year number was there. Now, when I look at this, that concept of taking the pot through the fire, it was to cleanse the land of the filthiness and everything that was done on it so that when they come back, they will come back to a clean and a cleansed land. And that explains and summarizes from verse 1 all the way to verse 14. The second part of this prophecy is a little bit dramatic. And I'm going to read it. 
also the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from you the desire of your eyes with one stroke. Yet you shall neither mourn nor weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh in silence, make no mourning for the dead. Bind your turban on your head and put your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your lips and do not eat man's bread of sorrow. So I spoke to the people in the morning and at evening my wife died. And the next morning I did as I was commanded. And the people said to me, Will you not tell us what these things signify to us that you behave so? Then I answered them, the word of the Lord came to me saying, speak to the house of Israel, that says the Lord God, behold, I will profane my sanctuary, your arrogant boast, the desire of your eyes, the delight of your soul, and your sons and daughters whom you have left behind shall fall by the sword. And you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips, nor eat man's bread of sorrow. Your turbans shall be on your head and your sandals on your feet. You shall neither mourn nor weep, but you shall pine away in your iniquities and mourn with one another. Thus Ezekiel is assigned to you according to all that he has done. You shall do, and when this comes, you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, the Lord, I tell you, I believe being Ezekiel was one of the hardest assignment that a man could be given. When I look at the mandate of this prophetic ministry, it is one of the hardest. It is not the easiest. The man in the previous chapters, he was even told to cook with human dung. There are days he was meant even to walk, uh, you know, um, almost naked. Now the Lord is coming for his wife. And the Lord tells him, I am going to take the desires of your heart. And this is your wife. And your wife will die suddenly. And when the wife dies, don't mourn. Of course, the, 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 there is explanation of how the mourning used to be done. In ancient Israel culture, those that have lived in the Jews, I mean in the Luo land and Western, they know burials are very dramatic. That used to be the same case in the ancient Jew, Jewish culture. Where when a man dies, you are supposed to wail, you are supposed to shout, you're even supposed to hire mourners so that they can help in the mourning of the demise of the person. You are not supposed to wear your sandals. You are supposed to go on a fast and open with a certain meal which never looked like a luxurious meal. It was a whole expression of what you are going through. Uh, you are also supposed to cover your beards. There was a whole ritual when a person lost a person that they loved. And as, uh, after Ezekiel encountered God, the next thing, the wife passes away. And the Lord instructs him, when your wife dies, do not go by the morning rituals. Don't wail. Don't hire the mourners. Don't take the bread of sorrow. Don't even take that fast. Don't take away your sandals. Don't cover your hair with soil. Because they used to unturban and, and, you know, just throw soil on their heads just as a sign of expressing that they are mourning. The Lord tells him, do none of the above. Because as I'm taking that desire, I don't expect Israel to react when I come in judgment. Now, of course, we begin to ask a few questions. But on this hour, he uses a very practical, Ezekiel is very dramatic, and many things that he does look like they are dramatized and scripted. And so the Lord uses a very practical example. And I want to believe also he was passing the very emotions unto Ezekiel because it was not even for the Lord. It was not easy for the Lord to permit the extent of damage that was going to happen over Jerusalem. Even him, it's not that something he desired to do. But the resilience and the hard-heartedness of the people provoked him to move in that, just, that, that judgment and the, the hammer had fallen and the judgment was final. And so at this time, the man loses his wife. 
Uh, this is a book that we have to read with a lot of sensitivity. Sometimes we tend to blow prophetic actions out of proportion. But the man loses his wife and is modeling a very spiritual thing that is going to happen. And after the wife dies, he's told not to mourn the wife because the Lord expects the same to the children of Israel. But on this instant, the Lord tells Ezekiel that I'm going to profane the temple. And he gives description of what the temple was. He says, I know it is the desire of Israel. And Israel will also lose the temple. Now, why was the temple important in Jerusalem? The temple was a physical presentation of the invisible God. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the civilization of Israel was bound to the temple. The civilization of Israel was tied to the temple. Anyone who touched on the temple and the laws of the Torah, you are interfering with the fabric of Judaism and the operation of Israel as a nation. The destruction of the temple was a clear sign. God was no longer with them. And the presence of God is no longer with them. They knew the masses of Yahweh. They knew the dealings of Yahweh. And so for the temple to be brought down, it was a total attack on everything that Israel believed in. And this time the Lord is preparing and saying, I am going to attack Jerusalem. And not only will I attack the walls of the city that Nehemiah came to rebuild, but I'll also bring down the temple. This was the Solomonic temple. It was full of glamour and full of glory. But when the people backslid, anything that does not have the glory of God is all useless, is brick and mortar. And at that time, they went. And after going there, when Nebuchadnezzar showed up, the war was severe. They set the walls on fire and they destroyed the city. They slaughtered thousands. The remaining were taken into captive and the temple was set on fire. Them that were uh, exiled already in Babylon had already been warned by Ezekiel that when you hear this news, don't mourn. Your mourning will look like you are trying to question the judgment of God. You remember when Aaron lost his sons because they offered a strange fire? And it was only less than a month in the business of priestlyhood. They were the first priests. But when they messed up with the protocols, they died. And when they died, the Lord told Aaron, don't mourn their death. In fact, don't even mourn them. Because it is the Lord who killed them in judgment. So mourning the death of his children, it was like questioning the judgment of Yahweh. So for the people to mourn the, what will happen, the Lord knew it was going to be disastrous. Anyone who had the news as a Jew, who understood what it meant to have the temple in Jerusalem, this was going to be disastrous. But he says, don't question my judgment. I am moving in judgment. In half time I've spoken to you and you have refused to repent. So this time you cannot, you cannot mock and you cannot look like you're questioning my judgment. And you son of man 25 as I begin to conclude. Will it not be in the day when I take from them their stronghold, their joy and their glory, the desire of their eyes that on which they set their minds, their sons and their daughters, that on that day, one who escapes will come to you to let you hear it with your ears. On that day, your mouth will be opened to him who has escaped. You shall speak and no longer be mute. Thus, you will be assigned to them and they shall know that I am the Lord. There are those who made it to Babylon and they spoke of the terror and the level of judgment that took place over Jerusalem. And this was also to verify that whatever he kept on prophesying, I believe from chapter 12, was not a lie, but it has come to pass. The intensity of the prophecy and the, and the intensity of the judgment that was going to come, it had to be verified that it was not a lie, 
and it was going to come to pass. This is the Lord vindicating the prophetic ministry of Ezekiel because sometimes prophets and most of the times they are judged not by what they said only but by the happenings of what they said. And so when, we, when, when prophets speak and whatever they say happens, it is a confirmation actually God had spoken. And at this time, of course, Ezekiel was facing a lot of opposition because there were other sounds in Jerusalem that was trying to communicate over the people that indeed whatever Ezekiel is saying is just but a lie. It will not happen. The Lord loves his people so much and there is no way that he can destroy them. But the Lord vindicated the office of prophet Ezekiel by confirming his word to the letter. And it is because Ezekiel was not speaking out of his own volition. He was speaking because he had heard the Lord. There's something very powerful when a man comes with thou, says the Lord. You can kill the messenger, but you can never kill the message. Beginning from chapter 25, we'll begin to see prophecies against nations. And then after that, now we'll go to a very uh, amazing phase of, uh, of the book of Ezekiel. Uh, just to understand a couple of things. But now, tonight, that's it for tonight. It's a, it's a short exposition. Let's just make a prayer. Father, you're not a man to lie. You have exalted your, your word above the titles. And you vindicate the ministries of men. Lord, tonight we have learned that even in judgment, you still remain to be God. And you are faithful to keep your word spoken by your servants, especially those you have planted your word in them. Tonight, Father, we thank you for that revelation and that remembrance and that realization. I pray for everyone that is watching us and I pray that, dear Lord, may we remember that even the prophecies that have been uttered in our day, they will surely come to pass. You are not a man to lie. In Jesus' name, we pray and we believe. Amen. So thank you very much. It's time for us to give our substance and the giving details are there. 0726 714 and 817370, that is buy goods and services. And always remember, your contribution is what facilitates our high school meetings and our tent revival meetings. Otherwise, may God bless you. Till next time, have a good one.